Hello, I'm the director of the AIFC Academy of Law. Welcome to all of our guests. It's afternoon here in Nur Sultan, Kazakhstan. It's a beautiful, clear, sunny day where we are. And welcome to each of you from your various locations in the UK, Europe, the Middle East, Central Asia, and wherever else you may well be situated. First and foremost, we hope you're staying safe and well, and we very much appreciate your taking part in participating in this very exciting learning and development activity that we have planned today. So today's lecture is actually part two of a series. The series is called The Room Where It Happened, Virtual Classroom with AIFC Advisory Experts on the Development and Application of the AIFC Regime. Well, what does this mean? What room, what happened, and who are these experts? Well, going back to the very beginning of the development, the planning and development of the AIFC legal ecosystem, a very senior high caliber committee was formed and they were called and they continue to exist and be called the Legal Advisory Council of the AIFC. And this panel was comprised of English solicitors, barristers, uh, highly schooled and experienced uh, academicians and practitioners who were brought together to fundamentally form a brand new common law English language legal jurisdiction in Central Asia. So we developed this webinar series to include speakers from the LAC, the Legal Advisory Council, who would share their insights as to what was really going on at the time of the formation, and then also to comment on how things are going and how has the experiment transpired so far? The experiment being a grand economic development vision of the, Kaz the Kazakhstan government. So far, so good. Today's webinar is part two in that series. And this is really a commentary on civil and common law differences and a perspective on the function of the AIFC bodies. Now, let me just make one brief comment about today's lecture we realized that to do a very deep dive, granular, detailed uh, dis discussion and commentary on the comparative aspects between the civil law tradition and the AIFC common law jurisdiction, this is a big topic. We decided that this topic will, without a doubt, be addressed today but the focus is going to be more on the AIFC regime and why the regime was based on the common law system. We have a member of the Legal Advisory Council who will develop those thoughts and make comments along those lines. We also have a member of the AIFC Legal Department who will present a couple of the slides about halfway through the presentation on some of these civil law issues and fundamental differences with the understanding that we will be developing a more detailed comparative study later. So I wanted to go ahead and create that context and expectation as what the focus will be today when we are having the civil law discussion today, uh, my colleague uh, Asset Sivikov from the legal department also will um, have some support from a couple of our other colleagues who are participating today, a couple of our senior members of the legal department who also will be available to handle uh, Q&A and some other matters. So uh, on that note, we're going to save questions and answers for the end of the entire discussion for the sake of efficiency, but please feel free to use your chat feature if you'd like to write questions during the webinar lecture, uh, or you can raise your hand with a little hand icon that's in the lower right of your screen. And either way, we will 
one at a time call on each of you either by reading your written chat question or by calling on you if you have your hand raised and my colleague Almas will be managing that portion of the session. So with that, it's my sincere honor and privilege to introduce our featured speaker today, uh, Mr. Simon F.T. Cox, who's a member of the Legal Advisory Council. He's a senior consultant at Norton Rose Fulbright LLP in London. He has extensive experience of working on UK and international securities matters, including IPOs and other equity and debt security issues, mergers and acquisitions and investment fund projects, uh, as well as a whole variety of commercial and corporate transactions. Much of Simon's work involves frontier markets and working on securities and M&A projects for natural resources projects. Also, our colleague in the AIFC Legal Development Department is with us and he will present a couple slides, as I mentioned earlier, on some civil law matters. Asset is a senior associate. He comes from a very rich civil law background as well as some common law supplemental academic work. And we are thrilled and pleased to have both of these speakers with us. And with that, let me please turn the floor over to Mr. Simon F.T. Cox. Simon, please. David, thank you very much. It's a great honor and privilege to be able to, to address this lecture as part of the sequence which you have described. I'm still seeing David on the screen. I don't know whether technology is working correctly. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yes. Good. Um, I'm going to talk about the subjects which David has, has outlined. Again, as David has described, it's part of a sequence. Um, I have prepared some slides and I'm very grateful for the contribution of the AFC team for that purpose. So I'm now going to share my screen uh, and run the slides from my computer. I'm very conscious that there is sensitivity about the selection of a common law regime in a jurisdiction which has a highly developed civil law structure and an extremely accomplished and experienced and able body of practitioners. There are representatives of many international firms and a range of local firms, both regional and uh, domestic Kazakh firms uh, which are operating in Kazakhstan and the purpose of this presentation is not to try and have a beauty contest between different systems of law to describe a law as being better or otherwise nor as David has described is it intended to provide a detailed academic analysis of the different types of legal regime. The intention of the short session this morning is to look from the perspective of an English lawyer sitting in a sunny London in lockdown, that perspective and why the regime was based on common law, some consequences of that and how the establishment and continued evolution of the regime provides opportunities for Kazakhstan and international law firms as well as domestic law firms and their clients. It is an additional option uh, for Kazakhstan and it was an amazing initiative on the part of the former president to drive this forward. As David has mentioned, I'm on the AIFC Legal Advisory Council. This is a slide which Andrew put up in his talks last week. As you can see on the screen, our role is to provide strategic legal advice to the AFC and to the governor in relation to the development of these rules, review and comment on the draft legislation, formal guidance and codes. The AFC uh, LAC consists of Michael Blair, 
chairman, and I'm very grateful to his input for this talk and seven other members. All of us are in private practice. We're all English law qualified, but we all have experience of international finance and financial centers. And I think one of the key issues that we have to offer is experience as consumers of legal services internationally and to try and assist in the development and promotion of the AFC. As many of you will be aware, the AFC mission as set out on the screen is to contribute to the sustainable economic development of Kazakhstan and the region by fostering innovative financial products and services by establishing an environment that delivers fair and transparent financial and capital markets in which individuals and institutions act with integrity. The AFC legal and regulatory regime plays a vital role in developing this, uh, this regime. As many of you will know, the center of the AFC is the expo site in Nur Sultan. It is an amazing collection of, just at this moment, largely empty offices because of lockdown. But it is an amazing site with very high technology and facilities uh, competitive with anywhere in uh, the world as a center for operating from a technical point of view. And the ambition of those of us involved from the legal uh, side is to try and develop, help to develop a legal and regulatory regime which is fitting to that structure. As Andrew described last week, much of the work, the development of the law and the detailed drafting was undertaken by the extremely able in-house AIFC legal team operating entirely in English. Uh, it is an extraordinary testament to their uh, commitment uh, and skill that such a huge body of law and regulation has been developed so quickly. So what are the key elements of the regime? How does it play its role in the development of the IFC? On one hand, there's the basis for the constitutional status of the IFC, the way in which the laws are implemented, the, the uh, constitutional regime, which gives authority to the making of rules and regulations. And I will come back to some of these elements in slightly greater detail of, in a few minutes. Providing for the establishment and operation of entities in the IFC, companies, limited partnerships, limited liability partnerships, and a range of other vehicles, authorizing and regulating certain activities by AFC participants who are authorized or recognized, providing a familiar, flexible, stable and effective regime for governing commercial arrangements. And this is something in particular which ASSET will be talking about uh, in, in a few minutes. Providing a cutting edge dispute resolution forum, both in shape of the court and also the IAC, and again, I'll revert to that briefly in a minute. Uh, the promotion and development of specific areas of activity and ancillary laws and regulations. I think it's worth making the point, and this echoes what I was saying earlier about this not being a beauty contest. The regime that has been developed here and continues to evolve, which is one of its major advantages, is there to enable companies and other businesses to conduct the activities which they want to conduct. The regime's place, of course, is not to limit, except where it, nor natural limits activities, but not to restrict the ways that people can conduct business. So, Arrangements between two commercial parties may be evidenced by an agreement in writing. That agreement may be governed by any number of different laws. Ultimately, that agreement has to deliver an effective and binding commitment and a road path for the relationship between the parties which it covers. And that has been part of the background to the evolution of this regime. But of course, Kazakh companies can perfectly well contract as between themselves under Kazakh law 
Russian law or anything else. But this is an additional alternative, and by developing the skills to advise on AIFC law, local and international law firms can expand their opportunities. So as David said, I'm going to talk briefly on how the choice of uh, common law came about and its effect on the historic and future development of the AFC law and regulation. The basic distinction is precedent, although there are many more detailed provisions there, uh, which also uh, uh, apply. Um, judges take an active role in shaping the common law system. The decisions the court makes are then used as a precedent for future cases, and common law systems have laws that are created by legislators, and of course, that's always the source of the legislation, but it is up to judges uh, to rely on precedents set by previous courts and subject to the hierarchy of court decisions. The Supreme Court can change its views. A lower court can't normally go against the decision of a higher court, for example, to interpret these laws and apply them to individual cases. That's the buildup of precedent enables evolution and development of the law. And that is not, of course, to say that in a common law system, the legislation is static. It clearly can't be. Um, and we're all very conscious in all our different jurisdictions of the very dramatic legislative changes which have had to be introduced to deal with COVID-19 and the pandemic. But by the same token, running alongside that, there is the development of the precedent system um, with the role of lawyers and judges uh, being fundamental in that. In contrast, civil law systems play much less emphasis on precedent than they do on codification of the law, going back, of course, to, uh, to Roman times. As I've put on the side, civil law systems rely on written statutes and other legal codes that are constantly updated and which establish legal procedures, punishments, and what can and cannot be brought before a court. In a civil law system, typically, although not invariably, a judge merely establishes the facts of a case and applies remedies found in the codified law. As a result, lawmakers, scholars, and legal experts hold much more influence over how the legal system is administered than judges. Uh, in a common law system, there is much more influence for the judges in the development of law, but within the basic framework of the legislation and the precedent in which they operate. In looking at the different sorts of law, there are some fundamentals which any legal system has to satisfy. It must be accessible, predictable, fair, clear, stable and flexible, and be able to govern the activities and relationships of business. If it fails on any of those, then it's going to cause problems in terms of administration and implementation. That's not to say that every piece of legislation is beyond doubt. There will always be areas of potential uncertainty, and that, in at least in a common law system, is where the judicial process and the court process can fill the gaps. English law meets these requirements and is widely respected and utilized across the world. Those of us who are lucky enough to be English lawyers have been for many years able to do transactions throughout the world where English law has been chosen as the way uh, of regulating and conducting business. And the underlying international trade regimes, uh, although they are uh, partly codified, have many elements of common law uh, as part of their structures. And common law regimes contain a number of principles which may not be familiar in some or all civil law jurisdictions, which are of assistance for commercial parties in the development and conduct of their operations. Concepts such as trust law with a differential between beneficial and legal ownership, 
uh, which has obviously a number of con consequences, not least in relation, for example, to trading of securities uh, and security arrangements. Concept of fiduciary obligations, restitution, ability to restore parties to the position they would have been in different circumstances, and streamlined and flexible insolvency regimes, both to provide companies with protection during difficult times, uh, with the potential for them to re-emerge out of that into active businesses, and also, of course, uh, ultimately, if companies do fail, ensuring that uh, the, their insolvency liquidation is handled in an effective manner. One of the things which we've seen in the UK, and um, many of you expect will be familiar with what it is in Kazakhstan, and I'm not, uh, has been the development of emergency legislation to deal with COVID-19. And a number of the former principles, which seemed absolutely normal a few months ago, have been adjusted so that in the UK, for example, um, there have been a number of attempts to protect people who are caught with uh, having lost jobs or their business being term temporarily suspended so that things like landlords uh, cannot evict uh, certain types of tenant for failure to pay rent. Uh, there have been accelerated arrangements for the provision of uh, debt to companies which need it and some realignment of the uh, priority of recovery in these circumstances. These are exceptional times everywhere in the world and the legal regimes have had to react to protect people but a number of these issues are quite controversial and it'll be very interesting to see what happens in the longer term. Going back to the overall context of the selection of the common law, uh, Dr. Kalimbatov, the governor of the AFC, has stated that legislation based on English common law works in most of the business space and those business transactions that connect us to the outside world. And that is, I think, a fundamental summary of the role of your regime to enable you to interact internationally in the simplest way and to attract international businesses, firms, and ancillary service providers to the center. Having determined that common law, and basically part of that is English law, uh, was the base point, it was then evolved, and Hogan Lovers did an excellent paper on this, and the standards of leading global financial centers were uh, then built into the structure. And the objective is to provide a concise, up-to-date set of laws on a standalone basis. I've taken the liberty of including in this slide an excellent uh, chart prepared by Michael Blair, um, which shows the, on the left-hand side, the UK, which has quite a complex source of, of legislation in terms of common law requiring a significant amount of background access and cross-references, um, some of them going back a very long time. Abu Dhabi um, had a uh, had a halfway house of incorporating certain laws of the UK by direct reference, um, and the Dubai International Financial Centre had a simplified and codified structure with its laws based on common law, and it is the latter case which has largely been followed um, in the case of the AFC. Um, it is a standalone regime. You don't need to know anything about English law if you know all there is to know about AIFC law, because it is a standalone regime on the excellent websites. All the law and regulation is accessible um, on the development of new laws. There is a consultation process, so you can all input into the ways that laws are developing. And as I mentioned earlier, it has a huge advantage of flexibility. And if there are aspects of the implementation of AFC law and regulation 
which are not working in practice. And there will be these, and a theoretical model is bound to um, need some development and modification or being stress tested by being applied in, in, in actual circumstances. Uh, please do feed back to the AFC team any feedback you have on the way the law can be developed and modified to work better for you. So it's a standalone regime, it's tailor-made, it is in English, which is a great advantage for those of us who are not as linguistically skilled as many of you on this call will be. As I mentioned, the AFC acts were codified and absorbed the best of the common law jurisdiction, the kind of flexibility and the concepts that I referred to earlier and laws of the top international financial centers. It has been a great benefit uh, to be able to have the benefit and experience of people who've been involved in a number of other jurisdictions to see where they've got it right and frankly where they've got it wrong. This regime provides for a whole range of other of activities, including corporate contracts, banking, insurance, Islamic finance, employment, and others. And one of the the important elements of this, of course, is it doesn't exist in a void. It exists in a very active, dynamic economy, region, uh, and economic world. And what this is all about is attracting business, the AFC, and to Kazakhstan, and also providing effective ways of developing business uh, and contracting between parties, forming companies and so forth. Uh, as David mentioned, this is part of a sequence of talks uh, and in exactly one week's time, I will also be uh, participating uh, in uh, another lecture. And in that, we're going to be looking to look at some of the ways in which this regime can be used in practice. I will, although it still remains to be finalized the structure, but I will be making some introductory comments as a potential consumer, uh, as an advisor uh, of uh, the, the systems being set up here. And we're going to look at some of the ways such as potentially holding companies, financing companies, investment funds, where this regime can be put into practice. So it's a sort of natural evolution um, uh, in the course of these lectures of, of putting into effect, and that will have uh, specialists from different business areas of the AFC talking about it. The coverage of the activities uh, which are addressed by the AFC Acts has developed rapidly over the last few months and will continue to do so to meet the needs of the market and based on best practices. Everything developing technology in its normal sense, but the technology of finance structures and so forth in a fluid and flexible basis. But importantly, those areas which are not covered by the AFC law and regime revert to Kazakh mainland law. And therefore, although it may be that the activities which a client is looking to undertake all fall within the AIFC acts and regulation, there are other areas where Kazakh law will be essential to understand situation and advise the client. And therefore, uh, most of the firms practicing in this area will over time need to have internally or have access to the expertise both of AIFC laws and regulations, but also of mainland Kazakh law. Uh, the tax regime uh, is a specific example of this. There is a complex tax regime, of course, in mainland Kazakhstan. And there are a number of exemptions and more favorable tax treatment for specific activities undertaken in the territory of the AFC and in certain other circumstances. And the tax background will be part of what we intend to address next week. Clearly, the court and the International Arbitration Centre are fundamental elements of this. 
because as I've mentioned, the law enables the creation of companies, it enables the development of commercial relationships and recording of commercial relationships between parties. But with the best will in the world, not every relationship ends happily and disputes uh, can arise. Under the guidance direction of Chris Campbell Holt and his team, the court and the uh, AIC are amazing institutions. Uh, I've been and seen uh, the court and the AIC centers. They are remarkable modern structures. I've included uh, some language from the AIC court website, which puts much more eloquently than I can uh, the merits and objectives of the IFC court. But it is intended to be a fully independent common law based judicial system for the expeditious resolution of civil and commercial disputes characterized by reliability, fairness, and accessibility. Unconditional application of the rule of law and flexibility that is responsive to the needs of global business markets. It is targeting transactions uh, throughout the world by having cutting edge technology, cutting edge systems, very competitive pricing uh, and rules which have been developed with great care based on the uh, laws of uh, English civil procedure, but simplified and developed uh, under the guiding hand of, of Lord Wolf to produce structures for dispute resolution, which hopefully um, will prove uh, a very effective and efficient way of resolving disputes. An important point to note is that the court and the uh, AIC can accept jurisdiction uh, over contracts which are not governed by AFC law or English law, but they have the right, the ability to accept uh, jurisdiction over contracts governed by New York law, Kazakh law, whatever uh, the parties choose provided that both parties accept the jurisdiction of the court in those circumstances. It's beyond, way beyond the scope of uh, both my expertise and the brief of this talk um, to address enforcement of judgments, but my understanding is that there is now direct enforcement of AFC court judgments in uh, mainland Kazakhstan, and that is one of the, the key elements of, um, of the development of this uh, as a local and regional center and backing up that the the court has specific regime um, for high quality legal education and training which is also being developed and rolled out more generally in relation to AFC law uh, to meet the needs of lawyers and judges in Kazakhstan and the Eurasia region. So what do the AFC laws and rules cover? I've touched on a number of these and I've taken the liberty of taking a slide from uh, Andrew's presentation. I'm certainly not going to go into the detail of all these, but this slide gives you an example of the very wide range uh, of laws and regulations which have been evolved and continue to evolve. Uh, all of those to a greater or lesser extent have had some input from um, the LAC, um, but most of these have been driven in detail, as I mentioned, by the internal AIFC team. Top left is basically what we might describe as the internal plumbing of the AIFC and the way in which the laws and regulations tie together and hang underneath the overall constitution of Kazakhstan. And the bottom uh, two right-hand boxes uh, cover the rules and procedures of the court and the uh, the arbitration centre. Everything else uh, are individual bodies of law, which of course are aligned um, to cover different areas from the establishment and operation of companies of different sorts, um, partnership, limited partnership, limited liability partnerships, uh, non-profit organisations. So those are sort of structures, employment regulations, uh, then provisions in relation to contract uh, and I including some provisions of what can and cannot be put in contract. The AIX regime, which I think will be touched on next week, 
AIX Eastern International Exchange has already been used very successfully um, for a number of very high profile uh, issues such as uh, Kazat and Prom. Uh, developing market, really uh, interesting opportunities and tax breaks um, if it's used effectively. So all these, to a greater or lesser extent, have, are the tailored versions of common law with input from other um, offshore centers and structures produce something which hopefully both law firms and their clients will find easy and effective uh, to operate. All these are continuing to evolve and the scope of these uh, is something which, as I mentioned earlier, can be responsive to changes in the market and the demands of clients. Um, there is ongoing analysis of the relationship between authorization in the AFC and activities in relation to authorized active operations um, within, uh, for example, mainland Kazakhstan. But all these hopefully provide an encouragement and a rationale for uh, contracting companies, whether they're Kazakh or international, to consider AIFC law as the appropriate law to govern their relationships, the AIFC as an appropriate place to establish the entities to conduct their business, including holding companies and financing vehicles. The listing regime uh, provides opportunities for accessing international capital markets. The investment uh, management investment company regime provide uh, the opportunity for creation of vehicles, for example, for regional or local uh, investment on a favorable structural and uh, tax base, taxation basis. There are favorable uh, taxation uh, regimes for uh, individuals uh, operating the AFC, but again, those are beyond the scope of this talk. I'm now going to hand over uh, to Assad, who's going to talk about uh, some of these provisions from the perspective of a highly skilled Kazakh lawyer, who is also a highly skilled AFC lawyer. Thank you very much indeed, Simon. Uh, firstly, it is my privilege and honor to speak, although it is a short speech, uh, along with the uh, AFC Legal Advisor Council member, and many thanks to the Academy of Law for this opportunity. Uh, secondly, as Simon have mentioned in my slides, I'm not going to identify the advantages and disadvantages of English common law or civil law. But I, what I would like to do is to highlight the basic distinctions or key differences between these systems briefly and in high level. And which will be followed by some examples of different approaches of these jurisdictions in certain circumstances. So uh, several points can be highlighted here. Uh, as Simon mentioned before, the distinctions between the legal system and precedents. Here I would like to note uh, the source of law. Uh, for instance, in common law, the first source is constitution. However, there is no written constitution in the UK, but exists in the US. In the UK, the key principles of the constitution can be found in parliamentary statutes. The other source, uh, the status and subsidiary legislation are also primary sources on uh, judicial precedents, common law and equity, which falls by the convention and international law. And regarding the civil law jurisdiction, uh, it is definitely the constitution, which is the highest and supreme act, uh, which is followed by the legislation, codes and laws and international law as well. And I also would like to stop in um, the role of judges and lawyers in uh, court proceedings. So in common law, judges make rulings, set precedents, and they act as a referee between lawyers. Uh, judges decide the matters of law and where a jury is absent, they also find facts. Most judges rarely inquire extensively into matters before them, uh, instead relying on arguments presented by the parties. 
In contrast, judges in civil law act as a chief investigator and also makes rulings. In civil law system, the judge's role is to establish the facts of the case and to apply the provisions of the applicable code. And lastly, the role of lawyers. Uh, lawyers in common law ask questions or, or of witnesses, uh, demand production of ev evidence, and pres uh, present, uh, present cases based on the evidence they have gathered. Whereas in civil law, judges, but not lawyers, ask questions and demand evidence. Lawyers present arguments based on the evidence the court finds. So uh, how it looks in practice, if we move to the, our next slide. Simon. Thank you. Uh, here I would like to mention one distinction in contractual relationships, uh, in particular related to drafting a contract. So under common law, writing an agreement down is not necessary to make it legally binding. An informal agreement such as one made verbally will be binding if it has the three components. Uh, the first one is offer, acceptance, and consideration. However, the UK Parliament made statutory exceptions to these rules. For example, many contracts uh, involving the lease, transfer options, and those related to employment and transfers and licensing of certain types of uh, intellectual pro property must be re in written. Uh, likewise, contracts of guarantee, guarantee also required to be in uh, writing. So, uh, so that each side is aware of his or her obligations and rights. Uh, what does the AUC contract regulation say about that? Well, there are no requirements for a contract to be concluded in or evidences by writing. It may be proved by any means, including witnesses. In contrast, uh, Kazakhstan Civil Code says that an agreement shall be in written form in the following cases. Uh, an agreement is related to business transactions. It exceeds a uh, 100 monthly calculated indicator, which is equi equivalent to almost 300,000 tenges or uh, 670 US dollars. And in other matters where the Kazakhstani legislation says that. It also worth to note that certain agreements shall be notarized. Uh, moving to my next slide. Uh, distinctions in corporate matters, such as the minimum capital requirements for establishing entities, uh, shall be noted. For instance, in the UK, a private company must have a share capital, which can be any value above zero. Whilst regarding limited partnerships, there is no concept of share capital and no minimum capital requirements. In the AEC, there are no requirements for private companies, but public companies shall have at least 100,000 US dollars of share capital. How about Kazakhstan requirements? Um, firstly, two types of companies needs to be identified. Uh, the first is joint stock companies, and the second one is limited partnership, or we call it TWO, which is, however, differs from the LPs to be established within the common law jurisdiction. So for the joint stock company, there is a minimum requirement of having uh, 50,000 uh, 50, uh, MCI, which is equivalent to roughly uh, 338 US dollars in 2020. As for the Kazakhstan limited partnership, uh, it is uh, about 670 US dollars. So these are the basic distinctions. Simon, the floor is yours. I said thank you very much. The vision of the, the founders of the AFC is very broad, and there are many different bodies. Your screen show a summary of these. Um, we could spend individual, multiple webinars on most of these, um, and certainly I'm not going to tax either my knowledge or your patience uh, by going through these in, in great detail. Um, but I will 
provide a brief summary of the ones that you've, you have on the screen. And if any of you want to know more about any of these, there's a lot of information on the, on the website, but also um, representatives of the AFC and the different bodies would I'm sure be more than happy to provide you with additional information. The Management Council is the supreme authority of the AFC. Its main responsibilities included directing the development of the AFC, coordination of the activities of AIFC bodies, and assistance in creating favorable conditions for establishing a leading international financial center, which of course is the overall objective of all this. The governor, Dr. Kalimbetov, represents the AFC and organizes and coordinates the harmonious interaction of the AFC's bodies and its officials. The AFC authority is responsible for formulating the center's development strategy, drafting acts on matters not related to the regulation of financial services. In order to spur AFC's integration into the global financial architecture, the AFC also establishes links with international financial centers and investment companies throughout the world. And they've been extremely successful uh, on this. And any of you who have attended any of the uh, AFC finance days or other uh, high profile events in Ur-Sultan have will have seen the extraordinary um, diverse uh, breadth of the links and relationships which the AFC authority have uh, developed with international bodies. The Asana Financial Services Authority, generally known as AFSA, is the integrated regulation regulator of all market activities, and ancillary service providers and companies within the IFC. AFSA's mission is to ensure the fair and transparent operation of financial and capital market systems within the AFC. The IFC court, which I've already uh, discussed, is independent and entirely separate from the judicial system of the Republic of Kazakhstan. It does not have jurisdiction in respect of criminal and administrative proceedings and has exclusive jurisdiction in relation to hearing and adjudicating any disputes between AFC participants, the AFC bodies, and or foreign employees, hearing and adjudicating on any disputes relating to operations carried out in the AFC and regulated by the law of the AFC, hearing and adjudicating on any disputes transferred to the AFC court by agreement of the parties. And that, as I mentioned earlier, is, is critical. It is by no means limited to AFC governed contracts. The AFC court applies the most up-to-date and efficient case management practices, subject on which Chris Campbell holds is extremely eloquent. The International Arbitration Center provides an independent alternative to court litigation operating at the highest international standards to resolve civil and commercial dispute, disputes in the AFC. The AFC has its own panel of over 35 highly regarded international arbitrators and mediators. I should perhaps have mentioned that the AFC court has some extremely distinguished judges, many of whom have held very senior judicial positions in the United Kingdom. In terms of elements of the organization, the Astana International Exchange I've mentioned is a diverse venue for the global investor community. Its mission is to develop a deep and liquid capital market in the region by providing clear and favorable conditions for private and public businesses to raise capital, both through IPO and through secondary issuings, issuance of uh, equity and debt. Uh, it is flexible and responsive. And I'm sure they'd be very, they would be interested in hearing from you if you have clients who would wish to raise funds uh, through the AIX, as I mentioned, but it, the, the detail is beyond the scope of this talk. Um, there are also favorable tax breaks um, from mainland Kazakh um, taxation in relation, for example, to income from and 
uh, capital gains realized in respect of uh, securities which are traded on the AX, obviously subject to the detailed provisions of the tax regime. The BCPD, the Bureau for uh, Continuing Professional Development, is a center for professional development within the AFC. The Bureau seeks to develop a highly qualified workforce in the region by offering opportunities for continuing professional development in accounting, finance, risk management, human resources, ICT, and corporate governance, among others. Within the overall context of this, um, I've been involved along with Andrew Alton and others um, on a corporate governance group, which has been evolving a corporate governance regime for the AFC, again, looking to bring in the best of international um, standards, um, but as tailored to the specific requirements of, of, of your market. The IFC Expat Center acts as a one-stop shop. Uh, my briefing says it's for over 500 government services, rather scary that anyone would need to involve anything like that number of government services, but the center uh, provides expatriates and their families assistance with visa related services, tax payments, police registration, consultations on healthcare, children's education, transport and accommodation among others. Again, one of the many, many steps being taken by the AFC to encourage uh, and attract uh, people to come and work uh, at the AFC once the lockdown is over. Fintech obviously has been an increasingly important part of the international markets um, and the AFC FinTech Hub aims to utilize the latest financial technologies to future-proof AFC's key business pillars and develop a vibrant multi-stakeholder FinTech ecosystem, bringing together financial institutions, technology partners, FinTech companies and innovators to help Kazakhstan emerge as a global FinTech Hub and a leader of FinTech innovation in the region and beyond. It's this combination of law and technology and facilities which underlies uh, so much of the, the opportunities and potential of the centre. The AFC Green Finance Centre provides the AFC as a hub for green financing in the region, offering strategic solutions for governments, financial institutions and enterprises, and facilitating the issuance of green bonds. AFC Business Connect aims to spur direct investment into the region, complementing the work of Kazakh Invest. Business Connect will address the needs of and meet the expectations of the international business community. And finally, but by no means least, the AFC Academy of Law. Academy of Law aims to familiarize the legal community with the AFC's legal system. It organizes educational and informational events and publishes material to raise awareness of the AFC and its jurisdiction. And I think this session has to the honor of being a small part of that, that process. So as many of you are probably already familiar, there is an extraordinary breadth and depth of law and, reg law and regulation and in terms of the institutions designed to support, encourage, the development and promotion of these activities. Um, it's been very exciting and interesting to be a small part of the development of this regime and with increasing participation by lawyers, accountants, other ancillary providers and businesses in the practical development of uh, the, the regime and all those businesses which it covers, I think the AFC has a very exciting future. And as I mentioned, hopefully next week, we'll be looking at some of the ways in which all this can be harnessed for the development of international business. I'm now going to hand, release my screen and hand you back to Almas. Yep. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, now we would like to open the floor to questions uh, that we hope to provide answers to. You can send in your questions by chat or you can look at your hand raising icon and press that and we'll call on you one by one. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague Almas who will run Q&A. So Almas, please. 
Yes, good afternoon, dear guests. So please feel free to tap on the button, raising hands on the right bottom of your screen or messaging to our chat. So as I see, we have several questions. Uh, first is from Ainur. She's student of SKS Hewitt. As I know, it's Kaus Gaston State University. She's asking, what is the difference between AEC regulations and legislation? Are both synonyms or first part of second? Um, well, the regulations are effectively subsidiary to the legislation and formulated under it. That would be my informal answer, but can I hand over to Asset or one of his team to give the official answer on that? Asset? You are on mute, I guess, I said. Yep. Difference between regulation and legislation. Can you hear me? Yep. No. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, thanks for the question. For uh, uh, Well, I would say, uh, the acts of the AFC comprised on uh, regulations and rules. So this is the type of the act, uh, which is based, uh, which is comprised of the AFC Act itself. Uh, when we say legislation, we say just the whole legal framework of the AFC or any other jurisdiction. So this is, I think, the key difference. The regulation is the type of the an AFC Act. Okay, thank you. So next question is from Saida Smagul. She's asking, hello, where can I watch records of previous webinars? Uh, Saida, you can see our previous uh, webinars on our YouTube channel. So we are planning to uh, post them there. Please uh, feel free to visit our YouTube channel. Uh, next question is from uh, Dmitry. Uh, are AFC court and arbitration decisions enforceable uh, on international level? That's a very technical question. Um, I believe the answer is the, I think the AFC is aligned with the various treaties, but I think we have, uh, Nerjan, are you, you've come on, are you able to address that? Yeah, actually I can help with this question. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, my name is Nerjan uh, Kospayev. I am managing director of legal support department uh, at the AFC authority. Um, so the question, yes, uh, it's enforceable uh, in accordance uh, of our bilateral multilateral agreements of uh, Kazakhstan signed. Uh, AFC court uh, shall be treated as the other courts of uh, Kazakhstan. So it will be uh, similarly enforceable as the court decisions of the court of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Okay, thank you very much, Nashan. Uh, next question is from Kanat Maminov, a lawyer from Kines LLP. He is asking, what is the potential for tension between the legislature and the courts of in the EC? So, uh, can you say again? Uh, what is the potential for tension between the legislature and uh, the courts in the EC? Um. So I, I didn't get quite well, but I, I'll try to uh, answer this question. Um, we are not the representative of AFC court, but in general, um, it, uh, we have different approach here. Uh, the AFC court is a common law court and uh, the, uh, the AFC court decision uh, will be used as a precedent and uh, we'll be, we will be having similar approach. In terms of uh, AFC law and using uh, AFC court uh, in the contracts, we, for today we have about 1,900 contracts uh, included 
AC Cotton Arbitration Center. And uh, more than that, uh, our national companies and uh, AFC uh, using uh, AFC Cotton Arbitration Center in their clauses. So potential is uh, really great. I think it's a very good potential, uh, not only for uh, the companies itself, but also for lawyers. And they can uh, have additional uh, source of uh, services and they can provide services here and it's open for everyone. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Alibek Nurbekov is asking, could you please clarify the difference between a legal system between stable and flexible? Don't these two words contradict each other? Um. I think stability is the ability to have a system which is consistent in the application of legislation precedent. I don't think it is, I can understand your question of course, but I think it is not um, inconsistent that the law will develop uh, going forward. Clearly the business community and the world in which we all operate is continuing to evolve and I think whereas hopefully there will be stability on the same facts but as I mentioned in, in, in the presentation um, that can clearly be modified by subsequent court decisions um, and also of course by changes in legislation but flexibility also um, enables responsiveness to change circumstances and I think one might look at this as part of the natural evolution. So I would have said that flexibility basically looks at the ability to react to changes in the business and economic and legal environment generally. But stability is confidence that uh, one can look at a contract or uh, an arrangement between parties and be reasonably confident that historical precedent and legislation would enable clarity and interpretation. Okay, thank you. So I guess we we'll have no any other questions for now. So dear guests, if you have other questions, please feel free to send us uh, via email. We'll be happy to answer. So on that point, David, please. Yes, Th thank you, Almas. I want to express my heartfelt thanks and appreciation on behalf of the AISC Academy of Law for Simon Cox's brilliant overview and commentary on the formation and the operation of the AIFC legal system. Very insightful, very relevant. We look forward to next week's lecture. Uh, Asset Sidikov from the AIFC Authority Legal Department, thank you very much uh, for highlighting some of the key differences between the common law and civil law systems. There will be more to come on that as indicated earlier. Next week's session will be uh, a continuation of the Room Where It Happened series called AIFC Financial Structures and Functions. Simon Cox already framed up the nature and content of that event. We're very much looking forward to it. Uh, Mr. Cox will lead off the discussion. We'll have representatives from our Financial Services Authority, from the Stock Exchange, and from Business Connect. We look forward to seeing you there. The mission of the Academy of Law is to prepare lawyers for international commercial law practice through cross-system education and focusing on filling gaps in traditional legal education so that lawyers have both the knowledge and the skills to operate effectively in an increasingly complex uh, global community. So with that, we'll sign off for now. Thanks again to our speakers. Thank you very much to our participants and have a great rest of your day. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>